Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You're still Lindsay. I'm still Dan. Uh, hope uh, everyone is doing well and enjoying the beginning of the summer. End of spring, beginning of summer, probably my favorite time of year around this kind of climate where you get distinct four seasons. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, uh, yeah, other, other than the, the pollen, which is why my voice sounds a little off, but you know, I'll take it. I saw a really funny meme from my friend that lives in Oregon yeah. uh, of just like, uh, I forget what movie it's from, but it's like one eye bulging out, one <laughs> eye swollen shut. Like, is it just me or is it the pollen? Yeah, yeah. It's bad everywhere. I know it's, it's uh, like that green dust just coating all the vehicles yep. and everything. <laughs> Uh, two quick announcements, and then off to today's horror show. Uh, a killer new Wendigo design, now available in the store. A super cool illustration featuring a pretty grotesque Wendigo-inspired creature trapped in some sort of glowing magic spell. New collection featuring a tee, wall canvas, and vintage-inspired tank top with an acid wash print. Always changing it up over there, the Art Warlock. Uh, head on over to badmagicmerch.com and check out this badass new Wendigo collection now. And then I know you have a... Uh, uh, charity announcement. Good job. Good yeah. job. I know the brain fog is real. <laughs> I know mine's getting, mine's getting better. Still there a little bit, but man, early this week, I was like, what is going on? I know this morning I woke up and I thought my head was going to roll off my body. That's the only <laughs> way I know how to explain it. I was like, why are we two separate things right now? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, happy June, everyone. Happy Pride Month. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the years, as you guys know, we've tried to donate. Uh, locally here in our community yeah. we've done it before with safe passage and this with month the, uh, 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 shelter animal shelter too a couple years ago oh yeah that's right mm-hmm. the kootenai county humane society but mm-hmm. i think we did that personally i don't know if we did that through oh, i thought we did uh well maybe we did you know one can uh, it's hard to keep up at this point which is yeah. such a cool thing to say very cool very cool um but anyways uh this month we've decided that in honor of pride month we are going to donate here locally to the north idaho pride alliance whose mission is to connect LGBTQIA plus people and allies to various community groups so they may create a more inclusive North Idaho through networking, education, and advocating. And of course, as usual, we are recording in advance, so you guys never have to miss an episode. So we'll follow up in the coming weeks Mm -hmm. with the donation amount. And if you'd like to learn more about the North Idaho Pride Alliance, very cool group of people, very, very cool, you can visit them at nipridealliance.com. Awesome. Okay, so what fan horror do you have for us today? I have three hosts for you this week, oh, nice. Dan. Yeah, it's gonna be a big know. episode because I got my stories are longer. Oh, okay. well, the first one is okay. Great. Well, this is gonna be a fun episode then. Um, well, in you know, in our new format of just like a brief little mm-hmm. uh, teaser, uh, we have three stories: one, chase from a cemetery; okay, two. A hostile encounter, and by hostile, I mean like a hostel that you would stay at. H-O-S-T-E-L. Not, <laughs> not hostile. Yeah. Uh, and then my third story, hard to explain it. I would just say like um, some words are exchanged. And okay. I, I don't, it's, it's very, mm, it's not a curse, so it's not quite the right word. I was struggling terribly to find a word to explain it. Okay. Well, so we'll find out. I failed. <laughs> my first of two stories, the longer one, mostly set in a hotel located somewhere. Whoever posted the tale never gave an exact location, and there are several hotels around the country that have the name Sunway Hotel, or have had. This is a nice twist on the creepy haunted hotel story. Okay. Very excited for that one. And then my next uh, story after that, about a mythical creature from Mayan mythology, the Alush, a creepy little creature that some people still believe in today, like the current president of Mexico. Oh, okay. He made headlines a few months back when he uh, tweeted a picture of it. Are All you, right. Yeah. That's new. So we'll explain. Are, are you ready to settle in from, uh, for some supposedly true horror with some comfy socks and a blanket? Uh, I am. Check out these babies. Queen of fucking everything. And <laughs> I would awesome. like to thank, uh, I, oh, now, a fan in Madison. And here's the deal, sweetheart. The ink 
smeared. So they're either from, I think they're from Andrea, but they could also be from Amelia or Angelica. Okay. I'm going Andrea. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea. These are, these are, no, it's IA. (laughs) So eh, wrong. Uh, And thank you also for being in theme with my purple today. Like, Mm -hmm. good job. And Lakers colors. I'm still rooting for them. I know. Down, down. At this point, I know we're recording you. We're behind. So it's (sighs) going to be settled by the time this is out. Well, we'll find out if I'm still a fan after this. But pretty bummed they lost uh, game two against the Nuggets. I know. Uh, Okay. So here we go. We've done uh, so many stories set at hotels. Hotels are just inherently creepy. Maybe it's a simultaneously uh, sense or simultaneous sense of unfamiliarity and familiarity, how everything can look almost exactly like a place you've been before, but not. Uh, Maybe it's how transient everyone is, simply passing through for a moment, and that kind of naturally turns people who've stayed before you into ghost-like figures. Maybe it's the weight of the potential history of what happened, where you're going to be sleeping. An unknown amount of darkness and despair may have occurred right where you're laying. What happened in the room before you checked in? What bad energy can't be bleached out of the sheets or scrubbed out of the carpet? This next story was posted anonymously by someone several years ago. Someone replied under the post that the hotel she mentions seems to have since been torn down. Let's hope so. Time now for the tale of the Sunway's revenge. I hadn't thought this was how my life would go. When I was a kid, growing up with a single mom, I'd always imagined my future life like something out of a storybook. I'd meet my husband somewhere, interesting, but not sleazy, like on a hiking trail or at a concert. We'd date for a year or so, taking things slow. He'd propose on vacation, and then we'd get married. And then we'd move out to some other small town or the suburbs, have a nice house with a big yard, a dog, have kids, and happily grow old together. I dreamt about this all the way into my late teens. Even though I was growing up in a pretty depressed one-stoplight town where people were more likely to drop out of high school, get hooked on drugs, and marry someone because they'd gotten pregnant than they were to go hiking and find the love of their life. As I got older, this dream seemed more and more far-fetched. I was a latchkey kid who went home alone after school to our one-bedroom apartment, and my mom died when I was 17. Right out of high school, I started working at a convenience store, hoping that I'd save enough money to eventually go to college, get a degree, and meet the man who would make my struggles worth it. Instead, I got Gene. The night he walked into the convenience store, I was already on edge because of some recent robberies. As a 20-year-old woman working the night shift, I knew I'd be an easy target. So when a handsome guy pulled up on a motorcycle, I edged my fingers towards the phone, one hand hovering over 911. The front door jingled as he came in. Evening, miss. I thought that he was between maybe 25 and 28. Much to my surprise, I would learn later that he was 37, almost twice my age. But as he walked the aisles of the convenience store that night, he seemed to have the swagger of a much younger person. Or maybe a robber. You okay, miss? He put a pack of gum and an energy drink on the counter, smiling an innocent mama's boy smile. Yeah, I muttered, just tired. He nodded, then disappeared around the corner. When he came back, he was holding a coffee and a honey bun. I rang him up, he paid, and then he slid the honey bun and coffee over to me. You look like you could use a snack, he said. And... If I'm not being too forward, he added, flashing a grin. Maybe some breakfast in the morning? What time do you get off? 5.30, I told him flatly. I was used to guys hitting on me and never wanted to make it easy for them. A time when most normal people are in bed. Well, I'm not most normal people. He grinned again and saluted me as he walked out the door. As his motorcycle sped away, I was convinced that I was never going to see him again. Or if I did, you know, he'd be drunk in our town's only bar, the swinging door, and saying something stupid like... Hey, you're that pretty little thing from the convenience store. When I clocked out the next morning, there he was, waiting by the curb, looking as fresh as a daisy. Maybe I was deliriously tired. Or maybe it was the fact that nobody had shown any real interest in me for so long. Even my mother had been too busy making ends meet to really be there. But I got on the back of his motorcycle. Six months later, we were married. And though you might be able to see where this story is heading at the time, I could not. Maybe I was too immature. Maybe I needed to believe in storybook endings to make it through my increasingly depressing life. Maybe I didn't trust the feeling in my gut enough that Gene was definitely not the knight in shining armor I was longing for. Except every time I started feeling that, I reminded myself that I would be walking away from or what I would be walking away from. A decent apartment, a job at the city clerk's office that one of Gene's friends had helped me get, and a husband who loved me. And if sometimes Gene got really angry, well, who didn't get angry? Nobody was perfect, least of all me. At least that's how I rationalized it. Things started off relatively good. We had date nights, 
even if they were just driving the car out to a field and stargazing. He taught me how to ride and fix motorcycles, and I quickly tried to learn the skills that would make me a good partner, keeping up with domestic tasks, budgeting, etc. Except sometimes I would slip up, maybe overspend because I calculated the days from our last paychecks wrong, and Gene would change into somebody I didn't even recognize. He accused me of wasting his money, even though he'd always said before that it was our money. He said I took advantage of him, and once, as I scrambled to get my laptop out to show him the spreadsheet so we could figure it out together, he threw my laptop at the wall. It shattered, becoming a mangled piece of metal and broken glass, an expensive thing to fix when we were already fighting over money. I was too shocked to know what to do. The next day, he apologized, gave me a story about how he'd had exes in the past who tried to steal from him, and I believed him. He bought me a new laptop and apologized again, told me it would never happen again, but it would. And of course, it would get worse. Now I know it almost always does. So three years after we got married, after he'd went from grabbing me in an argument and shaking me to actually hitting me, thankfully we hadn't had any kids yet, even though he kept pressuring me, I decided that I had to leave. I didn't deserve to live like this. I spent months saving up whatever money I could, whatever he wouldn't notice being gone from our budget, doing things like buying something at the grocery store that was 50 cents cheaper than what we would normally get. That was 50 cents closer to freedom. It was late June by the time I was ready. I had enough money saved up to get me out of town into a bigger town nearby where hopefully I could stay at a hotel for a few days. Then it would be on to a bigger city where I could disappear, finding some job that could pay me under the table, living in a sublet or a shelter if needed, until I could truly afford to be on my own. That morning when Gene got up to go to work, I kissed him on the cheek, gave him a big hug, and basically acted my ass off, even as my stomach turned to the thought of touching him. An hour after he left, it was go time. I'd already made sure that my things were in the car. I'd secretly loaded up in the middle of the night in case a neighbor saw me loading a suitcase and decided to call Gene. Wearing new clothes, a nondescript gray hoodie from Walmart, and a baggy pair of jeans, I got into the driver's seat and I drove away. I drove for six hours without stopping, and even then only to pee and get gas. Then I was on the road again. My destination was an anonymous sounding hotel named the Sunway Hotel. A mid-budget, two-star hotel, it seemed from the website, mostly for businessmen and people passing through. When I arrived, though, my jaw almost dropped. The Sunway was a massive structure, with four columns out front, a pitched roof, and mansard windows. The edifice was intricately carved, stone gargoyles peering from above, and I counted eight separate chimneys. But it seemed to have fallen into disrepair, which explained the cheap rates. There was a large crack running from the foundation up one of the sides, weeds spouting from inside it, and the windows were old and grimy like they hadn't been cleaned in years. Immediately, I was nervous. This was the opposite of anonymous. I had been thinking that it would be something between a Holiday Inn and a Motel 6. Cheap, corporate, totally pedestrian. The type of place where no one paid much attention to who you were. Something else about the hotel made me nervous too. It just felt too old. I pictured a fire starting during the night or a portion of it collapsing. As I stood there in the parking lot, a piece of broken brick tumbled out of one of the walls and crumbled into smithereens on the ground. That felt like a warning. But I reminded myself I had other reasons to be anxious. Probably I was just projecting my inner turmoil on this building. It was around 7 p.m., the time that Gene would be returning from work and realizing that I was gone for good. I wanted to be inside when that happened, in a room with a firm lock. I brought in my overnight bag. The young man behind the check-in desk gave me a bright smile. Checking in? When I nodded, he peered down at a notebook. Name, please. What hotel did they not use computer programs to register check-ins, I wondered. From what I could see, the writing on the ledger was tiny and cramped. Surely not easily accessible when someone needed to change their reservation or make a special request. But I didn't have time to explore that thought. Deep in my bag, my phone was vibrating. After stopping, it started vibrating again. And again. And again. Gene was calling. I gave the check-in guy my name. His grin didn't change. And is this business or pleasure? Neither, I said flatly. Okay, he said. You're in room 215. Here's the key. The key that he handed over was large and ornate. I suddenly wanted to get out of there again. I pictured a hotel room with a heavy bolt lock, not a flimsy key. And who knew how many other copies there were? Can I ask you something? I said. Why is everything in here so old-fashioned? The concierge chuckled. Yeah, that's something most of our guests want to know. Not really what you expected, right? The Sunway used to be a popular tourist destination. There are natural hot springs here. Did you know that? The swimming pool in the basement and the bathhouse are still connected to them and perfectly functional. You should check them out. 
but they were at their peak of popularity in the 1940s and 1950s. People traveled far and wide and became especially popular with, uh, uh, shady characters. My heart thumped at the innuendo, even though I told myself he knew nothing about my situation. What do you mean? Mm, people on the run, people who wanted to disappear for a while. Lots of mobsters and other gangsters. They'd know that they needed to hide out here for a while, so on their first night, they'd invite a bunch of women over and have a big party. And then when the women started to leave, surprise, he laughed, they wouldn't let them. They needed somebody to entertain them while they were hiding, I guess. I tried not to let my revulsion show on my face. The way the concierge was discussing women being trapped made my blood boil, like it was a big silly joke from bygone some bygone era. How interesting, I gritted out. Of course, everyone had a good time in the end, he said, smiling that same winning grin. Everyone always has a good time with the Sunway, though these days it's a lot more tourists and a lot less mobsters. He tilted his head. Anything else? No, that's it, I said. Thanks. I wanted to be out of that interaction as soon as possible. The minute I got angry or really did anything unusual, I would become lodged in his memory. So, you know, if, if when somebody were to ask about me, he would say, oh yeah, I do remember her. Still, as I climbed the creaking stairs to the second floor, my blood rushed from something other than disgust. Maybe it was his story, but I started to wonder, would I get trapped in here, just like those other women? I had a vision of a smoky hotel room, women in dresses smiling at the gangsters, trying to make them think they were having fun, laughing at their jokes while they eyeballed the exit. And when they got to leave, however many days later, plastering on a brave smile so nobody knew what had happened to them. If they got to leave, I thought. I shook my head. I needed to get in my hotel room and fast. Arriving at room 215, I slid the key into the lock and pushed the door open. Immediately, I had a bad feeling. It felt like somebody had just left the room that I was now standing in. The windows were open, letting in a light breeze and the curtains fluttered. But it was impossible for someone to have just left, I told myself. I would have seen them in the hallway or the lobby. The window was too far off the ground for them to jump. I was safe, I told myself. Even if my brain was telling me that I wasn't, I was safe. The door shut behind me. I startled but tried to compose myself. It had to be the breeze. Still, as I put my suitcase down gingerly on the worn out carpet, I wondered what other options in the neighborhood there would be. I could tell the concierge that I, concierge that I changed my mind or, or tell him nothing at all. Check into a different hotel. Might set me back a day or two in budget, but I could make up that somewhere down the line. I dug my phone out of my bag to open Google and gasped. Jean had texted me dozens of times. Where are you? Answer me now. Answer me now, goddammit. I called work. They said you didn't come in today. You better not be leaving me, you fucking bitch. I'll find you. Those were amazingly among the nicer messages. At that point, I knew I had to stay put. I couldn't go anywhere. I needed to limit who saw me. Gene had friends all over, truckers, people who traveled on a regular basis, and I didn't want to take the chance that someone might spot me and tell him where I was. And I knew what he might do because it was on my phone. I'll fucking kill you. Tamping down my emotional reaction, I'd heard this stuff way too much, but it still got to me. I locked the door and slammed the window shut. After fumbling around for a second, I realized that there were no locks on the windows. Fuck. Calm down, I told myself as my heart rate climbed. I knew the tightness in my chest meant I was close to having a panic attack. I counted backwards from 10, focused on my breathing, and felt it let up slightly. I was on the second floor. Very few people, probably nobody save some kind of master climber, could climb a brick wall and manage to hoist themselves into a window after pulling it up. I drew the curtains, leaving a sliver open so that I could peer into the parking lot. Then I ate a granola bar and settled in for the night. TV didn't work, so I couldn't distract myself with that. Instead, I scrolled around on my phone, wincing every time a new message came in. I know where you are. I'm going to come get you. You thought you could get away from me? Shows how stupid you are. And then, if you come back right now, we can work this out. Do not make this worse than it needs to be. You know I'll find you. It's just a matter of time. Breathe, I commanded myself. Gene was making empty threats, trying to sound more confident than he really was so he could bully me into coming home. I decided to put the phone down. But without my phone, there wasn't much to do. I thought sarcastically to myself that I should have brought a book or a magazine. Who knew leaving your asshole husband could be so boring? Soon I was settling into a very e uneasy rest. I found myself just mindlessly staring at the corner of the room, falling in and out of daydreams, mostly really horrible daydreams. And then it happened. As I stared aimlessly, half asleep into the corner, the shadows seemed to melt into one another, gently changing shapes. At first they were just blobby, dark spots, which I chalked up to my poor night vision but then they changed to something else. Almost like hands, 
with long fingers, grasping forward. Tap, 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 tap. My eyes opened wide. I knew I'd heard a sound, but when I strained to hear it again, everything was silent. Not even voices from other rooms or someone opening and closing a drawer. Tap, 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 tap. Now I knew it was coming from the window. My stomach souped with fear. Maybe it was nothing. The window rattling in its pain from the wind. Or maybe not. Tap, 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 tap. Slowly I sat up. I could still see the same sliver of the parking lot through the gap in the curtain. I thought to myself that maybe if I closed the curtain it would muffle the sound from the window. So I sat up and crossed the room. I reached out to grab the curtain and saw it. An eye peered through the gap, not six inches away from mine. Jean's eye. <gasps> I tried to yell, but then Jean's hand came smashing through the window pane, scattering glass everywhere in the room. With a roar, he crawled in, except it wasn't like he was crawling like a human, boosting himself through. No, it was like a spider, all of his limbs skittering up the window and then through, and then he was on the ceiling. Come here, baby, he said in a, such a disturbing voice. It wasn't anything like I'd heard from him before. Come here, baby, I love you. As I stared at him, blood welled up in the cuts he'd gotten crawling through the broken window, and one of them fell onto my cheek. And then I woke up. Gasping for breath, I sat bolt upright. The windows were closed, not shattered. The curtains were still parted in the exact way I'd left them earlier. The clock read 341. Nothing was wrong. I had just fallen asleep and had a terrible nightmare. Was that really all that had just happened? I couldn't shake the feeling that, in fact, something was very wrong. Nope, I said out loud. No, no way. I was getting out of this hotel, whatever that meant. I grabbed a few things I'd unpacked, threw on my hoodie, picked up my phone and car keys, and froze. I had over a hundred unread messages. They were all, of course, from Gene. I scrolled through the walls of text until I reached the last message, timestamped two hours earlier. You think I'm bullshitting you? You're at the Sunway Hotel. I'm coming for you, you little bitch. Fuck, I said out loud, fuck, 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 fuck. I slung my bag over my shoulder and ran out the door. Suddenly, I blanked, unable to remember which end of the hallway led down to the lobby. As I stood unsure, thump, 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 thump. Angry footsteps coming up the stairs. Fuck, there was no choice but to go back into the room. I stepped back and closed the door, trying to be as quiet as possible as the footsteps grew louder and louder and louder, closer and closer and closer. Bam, 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 bam. The harsh knocking made me flinch, but then I heard a voice I did not expect. Ma'am. Ma'am! It was the concierge, but he sounded wrong. His voice before had been a little grating, unpleasantly chirpy, now as loud and buoyant, as though he was speaking lines in a play. Ma'am, there's been a noise complaint from another guest at the hotel, the concierge said. Still in that stiff, bright tone, I frowned. How could there have been a noise complaint? I was sleeping. I hadn't been doing anything. And I hadn't seen any other guests at the hotel. But don't worry, the concierge continued. We've set up an extra special guest suite just for you. You'll be much more comfortable there. I crept up behind the door to peer through the peephole. On the other side of the door, the concierge smiled brightly, but like a predator showing his teeth. As though scenting, I was right behind the door. He leaned closer until I could only see his eye. The eye wasn't brown like I remembered. It was icy blue, like jeans. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I repeated silently to myself while the concierge laughed on the other side of the door. Part of me wished that I was still dreaming, that I would wake up, sheets drenched in sweat, mouth open in a frozen scream but another part of me knew this was all too real. I had arrived here with some kind of darkness and the hotel was feeding off of it. Creak. I looked to my side in the shadowy corner, the one I drifted off to sleep looking at, I hadn't noticed that what I thought was an armoire was actually a door and it had just swung open. Hurry, ma'am, they're waiting, the concierge said in a sing-song tone in his voice. I felt compelled. I felt like I had no choice but to go through the door, so I did, entering a small, cramped staircase that spiraled down, down, down. I didn't know where it would spit me out, only that I had to get away. But it felt like I was going down forever, spiraling further and further, the air temperature dropping, growing more humid with each step. It felt like I was in a cave. Finally, I pushed open another door and found myself in an enormous room. There were two pools, both with bubbling water in them, steam wafting gently through the room. The mist was so thick that I couldn't tell who or what was also in the room. Faintly, I thought I heard sounds of whispering. Maybe a group of people chatting softly and made out their shapes to the fog. Maybe I thought to myself, if I got to them, there was less chance that Jean would hurt me in front of them. Hello? I called out. Abruptly, the whispering stopped, but then started up again a little further away. Sorry, I'm lost, I said a little louder. Could you point me the way back to the lobby? Once again, the whispering stopped and I spotted a pool at the very edge of the room where it looked like a female figure was sitting. One leg inside the pool, the other curled under her. 
Immediately my heart was in my throat, but instead of feeling scared, I mostly felt a deep, indescribable sadness. As the feeling swelled in my chest, the woman raised her head and I saw her blank, resigned expression. Like she knew what was about to happen to her, and she felt like she was an idiot, not to have seen it coming. I knew that expression so well, it was like staring in a mirror. This isn't your fault, I told her, but she only looked at me with sad eyes, sad eyes that shifted to look at something over my shoulder. Run, run, she whispered, and then she vanished. Dimly on the other side of the room, I could hear wet, slapping footsteps. I ran ahead up a staircase and now found myself in the lobby. It was deserted. A sign on the concierge desk said, gone home for the night. Maybe he had gone home for the night, I thought, but something else was using his body. I turned to the front door, ready to get this nightmare over with, and I saw Jean charging up the front steps. Found you! He shouted with a repulsive grin, a crazed look in his eyes. He burst through the front door, which slammed against the opposite wall, the glass pane almost shattering. He stared at me triumphantly, his eyes burning like blue flames. You thought you got me, but I can always find you. I'll prove it. Want to play hide and seek? I'll give you 10 seconds. One, two, three. Part of me wanted to stay where I was, just give up. I wasn't going to get out of this. I had to accept that. Gene would find me, would hunt me down, and he'd keep doing that until one of us was dead. And it was probably going to be me. But then something hard pushed my shoulder and I stumbled back, running up the stairs. Four, five. I turned down the hall to room 215. The door hung open, a little ajar, and suddenly I felt a weight in my pocket, the key. I was positive I hadn't had it before, but now my fingers wrapped around it and I got an idea. A moment later, Gene was came swaggering down the hallway. Six, seven, I'm gonna get you, baby. I heard a soft grunt as he noticed the open door. A moment later, he pushed through it and into the room. Behind the door, I tried not to make a sound as it swung into me. Where are you? Do it now, a voice in my head said. I slid out from behind the door with a shock noise. Gene turned around, but I was already in the hall, pushing the door closed. As he pounded against it, I turned the key and locked it. Thankful for the hotel being probably the only one in the country where a room could still be locked from the outside, and I stumbled back. Let me out! Let me out! As I watched, the gap between the floor and the door seemed to glow. Dimly, I heard a low humming sound, almost musical, and a sharp peal of laughter as Gene started to scream. No, no, no! I didn't stick around to hear the rest. I got in my car and kept driving until I was halfway across the country. So, did any of that stuff really happen? I don't know. I really don't. Something happened. Something very strange. For a while, I convinced myself that whatever happened to me at the Sunway was just a complete and total product of my imagination. PTSD fucks you up. I know that. I had some bout of temporary insanity, a psychotic break, a nervous breakdown. I had almost convinced myself of that when I stumbled upon an article from my hometown. It was about Gene. He had been found dead. He'd been found dead at the Sunway Hotel. I checked his Facebook, and there were all kinds of rumors posted on his page that added to what I read in the online newspaper. One rumor was that the last people to see him alive said they heard women's voices in his room where he'd stayed for over a week. But allegedly, the hotel staff said they never found any evidence of other guests having stayed with him. They said that Gene was often drunk and talking about how the women in the hotel were crazy. The night before he died, an old friend of his who did a little investigating of his own said he'd passed the concierge and said the girls, or talked to the concierge and said the girls he'd been partying with, girls the concierge didn't think existed, had convinced Gene to take a dip in the pool downstairs. He strongly implied they were going to do some skinny dipping. The next day, hotel staff found his naked, drowned body, alone in one of the pools. There was no sign of any other guests ever having using the pools the day he died. There was almost no one else staying at the rundown hotel. I still wonder if the spirits of the women the concierge told me about had something to do with his death, if they figured out that he was a piece of shit, just like the piece of shit who had kept them there, and they decided to turn it back around on him. I also still wonder if he was ever there when I was there. I don't think he was, actually. I think something in the hotel, again, maybe the ghost of those women, scared me not just to terrorize me, but to really spook me into action, into driving as fast as I could to any place far, far away from the hotel they knew he was heading towards. And maybe they gave me a little preview of the horror they had in store for him. Whatever actually is the truth, I'm glad it's over. I'm glad he's dead. Honestly, I hope there's a hell, and I hope he's in it, and not prowling the halls of the Sunway Hotel. But if his spirit is stuck in that hotel... I hope those women are making sure he never has a moment of peace. Me? I'm doing fine. After all that, I realized I never needed a knight in shining armor. I just needed a few other women to help me out. And then I helped myself. But also, I'm dating someone incredible now. I don't need him, but I want him. He's sweet, he's gentle, he's kind and hot, and he's a lot of fucking fun. And if he ever turns into anything remotely resembling Gene, I know exactly where I'll take him for a weekend getaway. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That is a fascinating story. Because I'm not mm-hmm. entirely sure that I know what happened. Mm-hmm. Just like some weird, like how much was in her head? How much did she actually physically experience? I know, like how many like dimensions are melding together? Like mm-hmm. that would be pretty, pretty badass mm-hmm. if women who unfortunately yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the here's the not badass part. Yeah. Women who have suffered death at the hands of domestic violence yeah. and abuse. But if they could like, like garner kind of their powers revenge. and just get those MFers that are still here. I know. So it's a sad story with a happy ending. I know it has like a weird uh silver lining to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, no pics attached, you know, to this random story. Uh, I tried to find a creepy gif that I hadn't already sh- sh- uh, shown you before and I couldn't. Huh? So, I don't know. How about this mummified head of a nun from the mid-18th century? Whoa! Mm-hmm. Thought to be possessed. That is... That is just the... After looking through picture after picture, I'm like, that really disturbs me. Yeah, uh, like, I'm used to Uncanny Valley being on, like, a cute doll. But this has, like, weird... I know it feels alive. It's like it looks obviously so dead. This moment oh but God, also feels alive, anymore. like uh, like the eyes could all of a sudden just like turn and look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Okay. I'm good with that. One. That's all I got. Okay. Oh, that's all you got. Yep. And you said that there are multiple. Um, there's there's been multiple sun, sunways, so I don't know where sunway. this one was. Uh, and there's like a few still open now around the world, but um, well, that's okay. I'm good. Yeah. 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 That mobster kind of story thing makes me think like it could be in Las Vegas or like Missouri or somewhere like uh, that's what I was gonna say somewhere like uh, I was hot thinking, springs like, Arkansas. Oh yeah 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 the hot spring part. I guess they could be somewhere in California. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. First, I forgot about I don't know how, but I forgot about the hot spring part for a second. So I was like, maybe not that far from Chicago, but actually that would make sense for it to be like middle of nowhere. Yeah, Hot Springs, Arkansas was a big mobster like um, hideout spot. Oh, I didn't know that. But I couldn't find any um, doing like prowling around on the web. Couldn't find any evidence that there was a hotel by that name there. But yeah. there's hot springs all over the country too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. I was immediately anxious about Gene from the moment he entered that store. I was mm-hmm. like, he is a bad, bad guy. Yep. Yeah. That is like very predatory kind of behavior, mm-hmm. you know? just coming in late and yeah Mm-mm. no 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 good. nope 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 i i knew he was bad 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 Ooh. i wonder that door in her room if it okay if that if, was real i know was that real and then i thought about like adjoining hotel rooms mm-hmm. you know and like what a great ho- uh movie premise that could be of like you know we get hotel rooms yeah. they're often like you know, our kids are older now, so we need a different amount of space. So it's like, okay, adjoining rooms and the kids are on one room and we're in the other room. And like, mm-hmm. what if, you know, in the middle of the night we heard a sound and we open the adjoining door and we're transported to some sort of hell. Ugh. That is a great premise. I know. I like the premise of like the the, the hidden door inside a room that leads down to like a hot spring, like something down in the basement. Yeah. And like, why was this here? Yeah. Like, and I couldn't see that being built in some like weird eccentric hotel. Totally. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that uh, the reason that the hot springs were haunted was that not the women so much, but Mm -hmm. that like mobsters brought other mobsters there and killed them or, you know, Mm -hmm. used that place to hide bodies. And Oh, yeah. (sighs) Interesting, interesting story. That was very, very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I liked it. I liked it like a good change of pace. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thank good, you so much. good. Thank you so much. Um, are you ready to uh, to meet a creepy little forest sprite? Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> really, really interested in what's going on here. Okay, the second story, not really scary in any way to me, not necessarily cool or wild, but very interesting. Ooh, mm-hmm. nice. An Alush is a creature from Mayan mythology, originating from the indigenous people of the Yucatan Peninsula and Guatemala. Sometimes called allies of evil, hmm. many people still worry about them, although they can bring good luck and protect property. If offended, they can instead cause chaos and destruction. Time now for the tale of the Alushes. Alushes are typically described as very small human-like beings, only coming from, uh, up to about knee height, and they resemble Maya people wearing traditional clothing. They're said to have wide owl-like eyes, and some reportedly have the body parts of animals like iguanas, deer, and macaws. In some regions, the Alushes appear as dark shadows with glowing red eyes. Normally invisible, but they can take on physical form to communicate with or frighten humans. They can be found in forests, caves, and fields, but also can appear in other places if the right offerings are made. 
Origin stories of the Alushes vary. The Yucatan Times writes, According to an old legend, the Alushes are older than the Mayan people, or than the Maya people. They are primal men, those who built the big cities. They worked very quickly in the dark because the sun had not yet appeared, and when this happened, they all turned to stone. The legend of the Alushes is thought to come from creation myths of the Quiche people in Guatemala. The Quiche believed that before humans, the gods created a race of dwarves out of mud. The dwarves built stone houses and had eyes that could see the ends of time. After the dwarves behaved wickedly, the world was destroyed in a flood, and they turned to stone when the sun re-entered or returned. Alushes are believed to be depicted in clay figurines, which sh uh, shamans cast spells on to bring them to life. It is believed that the Alushes originate from the Lord of the Corn and were sent to bless fields of maize primarily. Farmers would go to shamans to create a statue of an Alush using a combination of mud and the farmer's blood, which would bound the Alush to the farmer. After seven weeks, the Alush would be brought to life by the shaman through prayers and offerings. Sometimes farmers or villagers left clay figures under the oldest trees in their land. Sometimes they still do. Or they would build a small house for the Alush called the Katal Alush. The farmers would bring food and drinks daily until the clay figure disappears. Once this happens, the farmer knows the Alush is alive and will protect their land for the next seven years. Once summoned through this process, the Alush, uh, Alushes are supposed to guard the land, help crops grow, and summon rain. After the passage of seven years, if the farmer does not close the windows and the doors of the Alushes, uh, Alushes' home, it will escape and bring and begin causing mischief. If a farmer moves onto land where an Alush is already present, they must provide offerings and say prayers or they will be plagued by misfortune, such as drought and thieves. According again to the Yucatan, uh, Yucatan Times, if an, uh, if an Alush's master dies before seven years have passed, the creature goes to serve the god of corn. If a new owner takes over the property, the Alush causes mischief until they receive a food offering and prayers. Uh, Alushes uh, sometimes ask farmers and others for an offering. Uh, if the person refuses, the Alush will cause chaos and disease. But if they provide an offering, the Alush will protect them from danger and bring good luck. If an individual experiences a string of bad luck, it is often said they have offended an Alush. An Alush can't necessarily cause physical harm by attacking someone, but they can curse people with illness or destroy an individual's surroundings. There are some modern examples of how some people believe the Alushes have exerted their influence over humans. In the early 90s, during the construction of a bridge between Cancun and Playa del Carmen, the first three attempts to build the bridge failed. A person of Mayan heritage reported, uh, reportedly came to the construction site and told the workers they had angered an Alush and that the creature would continue to wreak havoc on the project until they built a shelter for it. The crew decided to call in a shaman. The shaman completed a ritual to contact the Alushes and create a pact that would allow the construction crew to finish the project safely. A small pyramid and house were built for uh, a variety of Alushes. The crew then had no more major problems with construction and the bridge was completed. The temple remained there until 2022 when the road was reconfigured. Hopefully they're not having more trouble now. There are online rumors that Elton John's April 2010 stage collapse for his concert at Chichen Itza was caused when organizers failed to ask uh, the Alushes for permission to hold the concert on sacred ground. Three workers were injured, one of them suffered a broken leg. Today, some hotels, restaurants, shops, and other businesses still have houses built for the Alushes to keep them from causing mischief. And very recently, on February 25th, 2023, Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador tweeted two photos, one of which he claimed depicted an Alush. The photo was reportedly taken by an engineer working on the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, helping build a tourist train project called the Maya Train. The tweet translated into English reads, I share two photos of our supervision of the Maya train works, one taken by an engineer three days ago, apparently from an Alush, another by Diego Prieto of a splendid pre-Hispanic sculpture. Everything is mystical. As with many creatures from ancient folklore, there are still a few who believe in their existence, including Mexico's current president. Can you imagine one of our presidents saying that, like, you know, this like garden mythological creature or this paranormal entity mm -hmm. is, you know, like, why we can't, like, build a bridge? <laughs> I know. They're, they're, they would be immediately, uh, they'd be laughed out of office. Yeah, You would hope, but yet there are... That's true. Millions of people who believe in QAnon, and the which is even crazier. <laughs> and Lizard Illuminati. Lizard Illuminati. Yeah, there are people who believe that, you know, God sent, you know, a not, politician to save us from Satan. But I don't, do any of our presidents believe that? Mm, probably not privately. 
I think they entertain those. Uh, they act like they're open to those things to get votes. But I don't. I don't think I don't, privately they buy it. Yeah, I don't see them doing any tweets about it. Nah. nah. Yeah. There's been people who haven't denied it, you know, because they know it's good for business. Right. Yeah. I don't think they. I don't think they believe it. Although I guess there is a part of me that's like, okay, if we had a, a president or mm-hmm. you know a power a powerful leader who said they had a ghost encounter. Right. I wouldn't think that they were. That's happened in the past. There's been, you know, people who have, uh, you know, reported uh, seeing apparitions. Uh, like at the White House or? I can't. I want to say yes. I want to say yes a oh. long time ago, like 1800s. Well, and it would, I mean, people have died at the White House. Like, let's, mm-hmm. you know, people die everywhere. Yeah. I wouldn't, like, scoff at that. So, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Not, not that much further. Who am I to judge? Um, here's a few pictures. Here's a picture of two Alouches. I think it's just a plural way to say Alouche, I guess. Oh, Those are the little okay. figurines. Okay, this is not what I was picturing. Got mm. it, got it, got it. Here's another one. Just another one that somebody uh, made, you know, and then you, yeah, do this ritual of like, yeah, again, like blood and mud. That guy's pretty cute. I know, they're pretty cool looking, actually. And then here, and here's a here's the tweet. Can we, I don't want one. I don't want okay. one. Okay, here's a pic of Mexico's president uh, uh, tweet with what she <gasps> said was a photo of one of these creatures. Oh my God, that's creepy as shit. Yeah, so that bottom left photo is supposedly one of these things in a tree. Holy Hades. You can see like its hair, its eyes. Mm-hmm. Let's see a more close, uh, close-up oh photo. Oh my God, oh thing. my God, oh my God. Oh God, that's creepy. <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously it could be a doctored photo, you know, but like. But like, why would they? Uh, crazy. Oh God, that's scary. And also like he said, an engineer sent him that photo. Yeah. So that even feel, okay, enough. That even feels like, thank you. <laughs> that even feels like, like yeah. more validity to it in a way. Yeah. <sighs> right? Who like, knows? Yeah. Yeah. Someone mm-hmm. so scientifically minded, generally speaking. I like that he ended it with, um, what is it? Everything is mystical. I know. I know. I wrote that down. Yeah. Mystical. And I, I have, and I don't know a ton about this guy, but I looked into the president, the current president a little bit more. But mm-hmm. what I saw, I'm like, I like this guy. Yeah. You went to him? Mm, yeah. Okay. What did you like seems about? Um, you know, just seems like actually, um, you know, uh, very intelligent, uh, very, you know, uh, against corruption. Again, I don't know how much he's followed through on that. Right. Or if it's but, you know, words. like written some books uh, about like, you know, political policy that I was like, okay, based on the premise, I'm like, I think I would agree with this guy on a lot of stuff. Okay. All right. I, uh, uh, sorry, I was thinking about a note I wrote. Oh, uh, it, they sounded almost like skinwalkery. In your mm-hmm. description in the beginning, I was like, hmm. Yeah. Like, like animal like parts. Little ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know. They can sound kind of cute and fun, <laughs> even though probably not. Yeah. Probably yeah. not. All right. Well, you ready to settle in? I am. Okay. Who do you got over there? I got my traditional, Layla. Oh, uh, did, I didn't see. Is baby Baphomet over mm-hmm. there? Yeah. Just hey, hanging out here. Hey, baby B. <laughs> oh, I love but, you, buddy. Then I got a bunch of creepy dolls on the table. I know. I didn't. I don't think baby. Wait, is baby secret out there? I can't tell. No. No. Somewhere in this office is Baby Secret. When we had the uh, an episode yeah. that just came out, you know, okay, today's the in, we're in May, so it was like the birthday present. People were sending in emails about like, oh, strange toys they've gotten or whatever, and somebody sent an email about Baby Secret. I'm like, oh, you yeah, know, we have one. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That thing is creepy. It's a <laughs> creepy concept. I like to whisper in the dark. Like, the, yeah, the weird things it says when you pull it string. Tell me a secret. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember okay, all right. so strange. Is anyone else awake? Oh, y- yes, there is something like that. Mm-hmm, that's Are one of them. Are you awake right now? <laughs> that, what's, uh, in a way, I want to believe that whoever created that toy, so like, it was like their own, their own private hysterical joke. Yeah, it's a yeah. ridiculous uh, doll. Oh, all right, well, off to cemeteries? Let's do it. Let's do it. Dear Dan, Lindsay, and all Scared to Death fans, My name is Savannah, and this is a story about a creepy and scary moment in a haunted cemetery. The cemetery is located in Kernville, California. I've always believed that if you pay no attention to the subtle hints of paranormal activity or ghosts, they will simply leave you alone. I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to tell you a story that happened to my husband and I just this past year. Chris and I always find a love finding new places to visit, especially places that are haunted. We came across this cemetery that had old gravestones and weird-looking cages around the gravestones. We decided that we would come back at midnight to explore. Midnight rolled around, and we drove to the cemetery with just our flashlights from our phones. While walking around, nothing seemed out of the ordinary until the gate we had just walked through let out a small screech. Chris asked me, Did you close the gate when we walked through? Yeah, I did. 
It was the middle of summer and it wasn't cold, but there was a small breeze that came across the cemetery as we were walking through it. The cemetery is known for its burials of the 1870s. There are small gravestones with the words child, followed by the age if known and the date of the burial. We noticed the gravestones that were surrounded by the fences. It felt like they were meant to keep something in. After hearing the gate screech and feeling the cold wind, I told Chris that maybe we should just leave, but he insisted we stay a bit longer. And just then, a faint but somehow weirdly loud whistle started. I yelled at my husband, Chris, not funny, Chris. But he replied, I didn't do that. We were already at the back of this little cemetery feeling scared, and we decided it was time to head towards our car. The whistle kept growing louder and closer as we picked up the pace to our car. We opened the gate, which of course now didn't make a single noise as we swung it open. We jumped into our car and quickly sped towards home. The road home was in a canyon. It was narrow, full of turns, and the river was right below us. While driving, we were talking about the creepy things that we had just encountered at this cemetery. We had never felt that scared or felt the presence of something before, and we've been to a lot of haunted places. Driving back, I noticed a car drifting into our lane coming directly towards us. I began honking and flashing my lights to let the know the to let the driver know that we were on the road too and that they were on the wrong side. I had to swerve our car to get out of the way. We hit the guardrail, but luckily we didn't go plummeting down the canyon towards the river. We came to a screeching halt. Chris was hyperventilating and had to get out of the car to catch his breath. The other car almost ran us off the road. That car could have killed us. Except now, there was no other car in sight. No taillights or brake lights heading down the road. The other car had vanished, disappeared without a trace. Did we imagine it? It was late. We could have just been exhausted. Was there an actual car that fled the scene quickly? Or was it the ghost we had felt in the cemetery chasing us out of its home and out of its canyon? Whatever it was, we no longer drive through that canyon late at night. By the way, Chris makes me listen to you at night when falling asleep. (laughs) He must love your voices, but it creeps me out because he falls asleep quickly, leaving me to listen to the stories alone in the dark. Savannah and Chris. <laughs> Savannah and Chris. Like, oh, poor Savannah. I'm sorry. He does that. That's so rude. That's a terrible way to fall asleep. Like, just, terrible. Yeah. Just scary, scary tales. Mm-hmm. Fun little tale. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, um, uh, if she wasn't going to make that connection between the whistling like figure and then the car, uh-huh. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, was it the same thing? Kind of funny to think about a ghost like getting into a phantom car and driving off. I know. Well, kind of interesting to think about like it didn't want you in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times in cemetery stories, it just seems like whatever's there wants attention. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know. I mean, sometimes they chase you out. But to me, all I can remember is like, well, it'll kind of push you out of the cemetery, but then leave you be. So to chase you endlessly— feels like a kind of like a remote cemetery too. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, just out there. It makes me think of, um, I mean, I guess there's a decent road, but when we go up to Green Bluff, there is this little old cemetery like out up, uh, on the prairie the, on the left so- side of the road as we're heading up towards Green Bluff. Like up that hill? Uh, but, no, before you get to the, you have to make the, like uh, there's a roundabout. Like you're, you're driving. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, past that oh, round. Oh, yes. Yes. On the left-hand side. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I know that there's, you know, like, like, Places like that where there was like a little community that really kind of no longer exists, little farm community that's yeah. no longer, that are like even further from a main road. Mm-hmm. Like I've seen those. And uh, man, after all the stories we've like, you know, heard here. Yeah. I don't think I would do well in one of those little cere- uh, cemeteries, like a remote cemetery at night. That is an incredibly spooky setting. Yeah. When there's no other, like there's no traffic going by. Mm-hmm. You're just totally alone. You know, like n- no other people or like. Uh, things making sounds like normal sounds like houses and yeah. stuff where you're like oh that's probably a car or that's probably a neighbor right you just question every sound yeah I think so and I think like when you have those random remote location cemeteries it's probably an entire town that's buried there like maybe mm. you know a, a disease took them out or yeah. I don't know I just kind of imagine like there being this like old man ghost with like a shotgun in a rocking chair just sort of like protecting the graveyard like this is my town yeah 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 I don't know don't know all right you want to uh explore what well, like you had a interesting hotel story I have a different kind of like hotel hostel yeah, hostel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, a place that similarly, like you started your story off with, like, you know, it has that weird kind of vibe of familiarity and yet complete um, 
like yeah. disconnection from yeah. it. What happened here before to that, those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the hostels, I mean, generally so many people passing through them mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, just a different vibe altogether. Yeah. All right. Well, let's have at it. Okay. Hello, queen of bad magic and master sucker. Mm -hmm. My name is Eli and I'm from Bozeman, Montana. Nice. However, this story I'm about to tell you takes place in Guadalajara, Mexico. I've always been curious and wanted to believe in the existence of ghosts. My experiences that I had on these two separate nights at this hostel have made me into a true believer because I have no other way to explain it. In the summer of 2022, I was starting an eight-month solo backpacking trip through Central and South America. Cool. I know, so jealous. My first stop was a little beach town in Central Mexico, uh, Sayalita. Uh, Sayalita, Mexico was known for its beautiful beaches, surfing, huge backpacking culture, and wild all-night parties. <laughs> I couldn't think of a better way to start. After a week and what felt like a hundred shots of tequila, it was time to move on from Sayalita. The next stop was the old colonial city of Guadalajara. I wanted to really see the Mexican culture and had heard there was no better place. The hostel I decided to stay in was in the historic center of the city in a very beautiful old building. An old stone staircase leading up to the main floor, it had ceramic tiles with beautiful colored patterns and large stone columns in the main room. I'm guessing the building itself was at least 100 years old in a city that's almost 500 years old. Wow. I arrived late on a Thursday night and the hostel was completely empty. Everyone had gone out on a pub crawl. Therefore, most wouldn't be back until the early hours in the morning, to which I thought, perfect. A nice, relaxing night after my crazy week. I still had a small leftover joint from the week before and decided to go out onto the terrace that overlooked the street. I was going to have a smoke, listen to music, and have an early night by myself. I went out onto the terrace, closed the big Victorian doors behind me, and put my headphones in, and went to light my joint. However, before I could light it, mm -hmm. I got a very weird feeling that someone had walked out onto the terrace and was standing right behind me. I could just feel them there. That unmistakable feeling. I turned around, fully expecting to see someone, but of course, no one was there. The doors I had just pulled closed were now wide open. The long white curtains that hung from the top of the doors were blowing as if there was a strong wind, but I felt no breeze coming. All the lights were still off inside and I couldn't hear anyone moving around. I had the unsettling feeling that something was watching me from inside, just staring at me from the darkness. I started to feel anxious, sick to my stomach, and my body was covered in chills. I walked as fast as I could back inside to my room, looking down and turning on every light as I passed it. I laid awake with the lights on until someone came back from the bar and turned them all off. The next few nights at the hostel were uneventful in terms of the paranormal. They were replaced with street tacos, blurry <laughs> long nights, and meeting people from all over the world in the birthplace of tequila and mariachi music. I had put the first night's incident in the back of my mind. Fast forward to the next Thursday night. I was out on the pub crawl with the whole hostel. After about the second bar on the route, a girl I'd been hanging out with for weeks mm -hmm. asked me if I wanted to head back to the hostel for some alone time. Of course I accepted. When we arrived back at the hostel, it was empty other than the front desk worker. My friend and I headed to the living room area, the big common area almost every hostel has, with couches, a ping pong table, and a guitar in the corner. Her and I laid on the couch where talking led to other things, and as things were heating up a bit, the guitar began to play, as if someone had run their fingers across the strings ever so slowly. We immediately stopped, looked at each other, looked at the guitar. What the fuck was that? She said, her voice shaking. I said, uh, yeah, it was the guitar. Let's get the fuck out of here. We both stayed awake next to the well-lit reception area until more people came back from the bars. The next morning, I had to tell someone what had happened. I went to the reception desk and talked to a guy that had worked there for many years. Hey, uh, crazy question for you, but have you had anything weird ever happen to you here? You know, like ghosts or anything? He immediately replied with, oh yeah, you have to be careful in here, especially at night and especially if you're alone. There's a little girl that lives here. Chills ran all over my body and everything that had happened was instantly confirmed for me. He told me that during COVID, when the hostel was completely empty, he would hear little footsteps running up and down the stairs, door slamming and knocking to his door at night. 
Also, supposedly, a girl who had been working at the front desk one night saw what looked to be a little head peeking around the corner, looking at her from the hallway before disappearing into the dark. He said he didn't know what the hostel was before. I think that whatever it was, it definitely had some former residents still there. I hope this story gave you some chills as it did me. At the time of writing this, I'm still traveling and have ended up in Paris. Ah, nice. Yeah, and this uh, this was sent in sometime this year, so been at it for Man, a while. Fun. Good job, Eli. I know, I love it. And yeah. probably so many more great stories. Yeah, what a cool thing to be able to do. I know. Backpack around like that. Yep, yeah, yep. live simply and yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a kid I went to uh, college with that um, just an adventurous guy. I actually, I mean, it was sad at the time, but like something happened. He was, his. well, I think his mom got cancer and died like his sophomore year. Oh, fuck. And it changed him. Of course it did. And, uh, you know, like he was on a more traditional path. Uh-huh. And then around that time, and then he went to like Florence, the study abroad program. Uh-huh. And was just like, you know what? He's like, I like it over here and I just want to like be here. And so he went back cool. long enough to graduate and then he moved back to Florence and then he just like hung around and he started some like tour guide thing Cool. and then just bounced all around Europe for years. Just oh, like, is he just, still over there as far as you know? Well, I haven't, I guess, I haven't yeah. stayed in touch, but I mean, but I mean, I bet. I, last I heard he at least spent like five, six, seven years over there or something that like that. Is maybe awesome. more. Just, you know, just was like, Hey, wh why does the fun have to end? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know tour guides. It's like, you know, you're not going to make a ton of money, yeah. right? But you're going to make enough money to live and you're going to experience people from all over the world and mm -hmm. you're going to see such special things. I think about our tour guide in Machu Picchu. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, and all over Peru, Chris, such a mm -hmm. cool guy. Yeah. Really interesting. And just, you know, he spends his days hiking the Rainbow Mountain or hiking the trail to Machu Picchu or, mm -hmm. you know, showing people around, you know, the city portions of Lima. I mean, it's yeah. just really cool. Yep, totally. Yeah. But uh, you've stayed in a hostel before, yeah? I did. Uh, oh, I think, have I stayed in a few? I can't remember. Definitely, only one I can really remember is was in Amsterdam mm. uh, a long time. And that was, and it was interesting. The people working there seemed sketchy. Yeah. And then we did have every, uh, a bunch of stuff stolen from our room. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, yeah, I lucked out and like my passport, I kept just, even when I slept on this little like, um, thing like around my waist yeah and if i wouldn't have done that it would have been stolen the other kids staying in the room with me mm -hmm. had their passport stolen damn I had to go to like i guess what the embassy yeah but it was like a huge hassle <sighs> you know, the whole thing yeah yeah yep. i've never stayed that i've never even been in a hostel oh yeah i mean the one i was in it uh, reminds me of like what um eli was talking about there's there like a common room mm -hmm. um kind of this one almost it was kind of like a, a little bar almost yeah and then that would where you would go for like you could get breakfast there and stuff too but it wasn't like you would have to pay for it it was an extra thing not like a continental breakfast yeah yeah and then it was like um bunk beds in the room and so like i think there was like four of us in the same room yeah. or maybe six of us it might have even been yeah six, yeah it was a bunch of us they make me as a female they make me inherently anxious totally and totally I, I would rather if Monroe was like listen I want to you know do this big solo trip I would be like I right, fine like if you're like hell bent on doing it we'll pay for hotels because I just mm. I mean cheap hotels yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> she's yeah. not saying five star resorts sure sure but for my as a parent for my own peace of mind yeah 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 mm -mm. nope uh, even if she was traveling with like a, a male con counterpart mm -hmm. I just I don't, know. I don't I all that said mm -hmm. we travel so much and over the years I have seen some like much nicer looking hostels like I always just think of like kind of like beat up old but yeah. I've seen some like ones that look like old holiday inns essentially huh okay so yeah. eh, I don't know and, and there is a cool I mean typically they'll, they'll call them like youth hostels yeah and I, I some of them I don't know if they still do this but a long time ago you couldn't stay in them if you were over a certain age and yeah, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't give me any comfort. Yeah, but, I, but I'm just saying like the, the fun part was, maybe just as a guy, you're thinking, but it's like- Yeah, you, know, you think you're, you're going to have fun. Yeah, yeah, you're just staying in a place with a whole bunch of people your age. Uh-huh. Yeah. And hopefully a bunch of hot girls for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for your preferences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still, I don't want yeah. Monroe to be one yeah. of those hot girls. I know, yeah, that yeah, some, yeah. some, you know, teenage know. guy, it just- like, ah, and I don't want to be that person. And I don't know, maybe if I grew up in Europe, I feel mm -hmm. like hostels are far more common there. Yeah. Maybe I'd have a different perspective. Yeah. You know, but yeah, how about that guitar, huh? I know. Yeah. I, know. I was waiting for the, uh, the clerk to say like, that, you know, when he's like, hey, is there anything weird happening here for him to reference the guitar? But, oh. but still, but what he referenced was even not actually creepier. Yeah, just a little girl, little girl. Mm -hmm. peeking around the corner. Yeah. I was just thinking about us being in our basement, hanging out. Like, what if we were just, you know, making oh, out? Yeah, like a guitar. And then what if the, the guitar wall? just bring? 
ring. I know it's such a distinctive sound that, that the wind can't make. No, it sure cannot. Yeah. It sure cannot. Okay, friend, you want to do one more? Yeah. Okay, great. This is the one I didn't know how to explain. And okay. As, okay. as you hear it, you'll see why. There is no easy way to uh, give a little overview. Okay. Dan and Lindsay. I started listening to your podcast last year when I moved from Wyoming to Alaska. Wow. I didn't listen to one song <laughs> on the radio the entire five-day drive. Wow. It was all scared to death and time suck. Thank you. That's awesome. Man, Do you, are you sick of our voices yet? One remote place to another. Yeah. While I lived in Wyoming, I spent several years working in Sorry, one of- I should have said rural. Like very unpopulated. That's what I meant to say. One very unpopulated place to another. Okay. Are you done now? I am. All right. While I lived in Wyoming- I spent several years working in one of the state prisons there. I had a mm. very specific job that was different from any other staff there. I was the disciplinary hearing officer. Anytime any inmate was written up for any type of infraction by the correctional staff, my job was to investigate the incident and hold a hearing to find if the inmate was guilty or innocent of the infraction. Mm. If they were found not guilty, staff would be upset with me. If they were found guilty, the inmate would be upset with me. <laughs> Needless to say, I wasn't the most popular with either the staff or the inmates. I loved it. Ah, <laughs> funny. I was good at it, and I took pride in doing the best job that I possibly could. <laughs> with that said, it was a taxing job. Every case involved interviewing suspects and witnesses and reviewing the accused the accused's criminal record. They called the records a jacket. I got a case in which a particularly violent inmate was accused of assaulting a staff member. I did interviews with the inmate and staff members and reviewed the inmate's jacket. There was a description about the inmate's previous crimes in deep detail about some really terrible things that they did to two other people. Even with that information in mind, I still had to do a hearing and be unbiased in making my decision. The evidence was clear and I found the inmate guilty. As the hearing was coming to a close, the inmate, who I later found out was into some weird shit, said some sort of spell in a language I was unfamiliar with and said that I would be sorry. Not the first time an inmate made a threatening comment towards me, so it didn't really bother me at the time. That day was longer than my normal days at work, and so I left later in the evening when it was already getting dark. I remember it being the fall because it was cold enough to have frost on my windows and I was wearing a jacket. I stopped at a gas station to get gas before I started my 30-minute drive home. I fueled up and got a Diet Coke, my addiction. As I pulled out onto the street, I noticed a small girl who was standing with an older man who I'd assumed was her grandfather standing on the corner. What stood out to me about them was that the young girl was wearing a small summer dress and the old man was wearing a short-sleeved shirt. I thought to myself that they must be really cold because of the weather, but, figures, but figured that they also must live close by. As I drove, I noticed the temperature seemed to drop as I had to turn on the defrost so I could see out my windshield. On my way home, I had to drive through a small town called Fort Laramie, another town with its own ghost stories. And guess who was standing on the street corner as I drove through town? Yep, the same little girl in the summer dress and the old man that I had seen at the gas station about 20 miles back. There was absolutely no way they could have beaten me to the spot where I saw them again on the street. I slowed down to get a better look, but I couldn't make out their faces. The young girl waved as I passed by. Chills covered my body as I passed them. At the end of the block, there was a stop sign. And when I stopped, I looked back to where they had been standing, but they were not there anymore. I mean, I suppose they could have hid somewhere, but they were no longer anywhere in sight. I sped up through the rest of the small town and thought about how they could not have beaten me to where they were as I was driving on the only road and no one had passed me. How would they even get there? It was really creepy and I was getting ready to call my pops to tell him my story when it hit me. That little girl and that old man matched the descriptions of the victim's inmate's jacket. Creepiest thing that's ever happened to me by far. I never saw them again and the inmate was eventually transferred to a different prison. I was always interested in the paranormal, but never a believer until that day. I like to hear the stories that you guys tell because they make me feel like I didn't go crazy on that day. Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. Ooh. I mean, it was already creepy just like, you know, seeing 
you know, seeing a figure on the side of the road or figures in this case, and then yeah. further down the road as you're driving where it's like, they literally couldn't have got closed that distance before you did. Right. You know, like you would, uh, that's, yeah, it's crazy that like you would see a car just hauling ass around you or something right. that they would be inside. And then to add to that, that they matched the pictures that this inmate had done something to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The crimes that brought him to prison in the first place. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I know. In my mind, creepy, yes. But then in a way, I thought like, were they like saying like, thank you? Like, because like that guy got in trouble again? I don't know. Because like, what why? Was, what was his little spell? I know. And it to me, it doesn't really make sense that yeah. the inmate would curse Gabe, but then the curse would be to see these people because right. they're... So I was trying and maybe, to... And maybe just doing some mumbo jumbo. I know, probably. It's probably just trying to, mm -hmm. you know, freak him out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to reconcile the two things together and I couldn't quite... If he was really good with spells, he would do a little spell that would get him out of jail. <laughs> like, if he was a real magician. If he was a real wizard, he would just teleport himself to a place that was not behind bars. I know. Where's El, I don't, I don't, Give us, where's El Chapo? You know, oh, he's, he's, did, he's, did they get him back after uh, he escaped? He never escaped in the U.S. I thought he did. Uh-uh. No, he wants to. He was begging for his uh, old cronies to break him out of prison. He's in Supermax in Colorado. He, oh. He's never getting out. I think I got it smashed up in my head. Yeah. Now El Chapo, is, he's, uh, his days of his pulling escapes are long behind him. So you think? No one's ever escaped from that one or even come close. I know, but there's always a first time for everything. Yeah. I mean, it would be darkly very impressive if he was able to pull that off. Sadly, I don't think that he would be able to pull that off without like a lot of people dying there. Like it would have to be like an, ar an armed violent, just where it's built and, the, and the, the, the rocky stuff from what I understand around that. I don't think you can tunnel your way out of that bad boy. Oh yeah, that's very smart of them. I never thought about that to like build prisons uh, in places where it would be incredibly difficult to tunnel out mm -hmm. because of the uh, geography. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you done a time suck on El Chapo? Mm -hmm. I have. Guzman. I can't mm -hmm. remember his first name right now, but yes. Chapo. <laughs> Chapo. His name is Chapo Chapo. Chapo Chapo. I'm going to go listen to it. I was fascinated by him. He's a ruthless dude. I mean, yeah, as, he's a bad guy. Yeah. Bad, bad dude. Yeah. And, and, and I've like, uh, you know, with that stuff, it just drives me crazy because I am, that's one of the reasons I'm in favor of like drug legalization is to take away the income streams from people like El Chapo. Yeah. Because as long as like there's a huge market, which there always will be for drugs and they're yeah. illegal, you just, you know, then you have like people like him and they have to be ruthless because there's so much competition. To, to push this product and it and because it's all underground uh -huh. and, and people can't just go to the cops and be like, hey, uh, my boss is abusing me. And it's like, well, what do you do? Oh, I um, make cocaine. It's like, and so here's, there's just- But here's the thing. Yeah. You don't have to choose to be a drug lord. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, like, it's like, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, it's like a terrible job and you have to be ruthless. It's like, or you could just not become oh, a drug lord. totally, totally, totally. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Nobody has to do it. But the people who choose to engage in that trade and then make it yeah. to the top, yeah. they never make it without- a lot of bloodshed. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I do remember from that suck, like stories of him, like being, no, like you I would know, think, awful. especially ruthless. Yeah. Yeah. Although I guess also like the, the other side of that is that it's often, you know, in very like war-torn, poverty-stricken places that these drug lords are rising from. And so like, who am I to say, like, what would you do? Yeah. He grew up in a lot of poverty. Yeah. Like, like what would you yeah. be willing to do to come out of that? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I think, fucking anything so like yeah. i don't I, i'm not saying that he's yeah. a good guy or that it's okay but i i always try to remember that there's an element of like i don't understand because yeah. i am a white woman mm -hmm. in middle america like he, he you grew know. up in rural poverty and i want to say just pulling this from memory i want to say his parents or at least one of them like worked for like as a kind of like the lowest like the people who are growing the oh, the, the yeah. plant to then process it it's like the the bottom worker like way out in these remote jungle yeah. areas where they get paid all n next to nothing to do that yeah. and so he saw like that level and i think it was a, if i remember right like a thing of like well if i'm going to be a part of this or it's around me mm -hmm. i'm going to be the the top that i can i can appreciate yeah that mental space mm -hmm. totally yeah. wild Pretty cool. Pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, do you want to do some shout outs? Yeah. Who do you want to go first? Oh, you can go first. Okay. I'd I like to see how you do with your names this week. Uh, I want to thank the following uh, Annabelles for supporting what we do here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. To uh, John Salermi. Or no, I'm sorry. John Salmeri. John Salmeri. Annabella. Slamadama from the Lou. <laughs> from the Lou. Uh, Lyric and Mallory. Cr uh, Chris Ginther. Jeffrey Moore. Joshua Childs, Mrs. Violet. Sounds like a clue character. Oh, yeah. I love that game. 
uh, Bren Fogel, and then Christine Ballier. I want to play Clue. We haven't played Clue in so long. Yeah, I, I like Clue, even though I literally never win. But I, 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 I like it. I'm really good at yeah, it. Yeah, you and Kyler are good at it. I, Me and Monroe, more, not so much. Kyler and I fight more. Monroe doesn't really try. I, I think she tries. Sometimes, sometimes. But she just... She doesn't, she doesn't care as much about games as uh, you guys do. Maybe now that she's like sporty spice and she's a little bit more competitive. Yeah, maybe. Also, I can't stop staring at um, Crochela up here. <laughs> look, at, look at it in the... Uh, look at there you go. It looks like it's getting licked. Oh, yeah. Just with the wall <laughs> art behind it. Yeah, the mural there. Uh, funny. Okay. Well, I would also like to thank the following Annabelles for showing up and supporting what we do here. Nancy Pope, Colleen K, Kristen Diane Alexander. What a name. Mm -hmm. Melissa Marburger. Taylor Jane, Tori Barton, Kawhi Kanaka in Kansas, Ian Ferguson, Michelle Garcia, Andy Massey, and Trevor Hunt. If you are from Kauai and you moved to Kansas, we need to have a conversation <laughs> about how exactly that happened. Yeah, yeah. What kind of, who did you meet? Who dragged you off that island and took you to Kansas? Oh, dragged you away from paradise. I know. God, it's one of my favorite places in the world. All right, and then I have a few spooky shout outs. To Jade from Dan, happy second anniversary. I can't wait to see what life has in store for us. Thanks for all you do and for standing by me. To E.P. Gleeky Handsome, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> to E.P. Gleeky Handsome Yeen from Crazy Funny Talking Slow Fox. This is so great. <laughs> Thank you for helping me feel like me again. I love you, bossy Aww. boo. <laughs> love the inside language. I love it. I love it. Everyone has it. Mm -hmm. To Stephanie from your husband, the great Robbie Booby. I wonder if it's supposed to be Robbie Bobby. Did I mistype that? <laughs> Maybe now it'll be Robbie Booby. I know. I hope it is. Happy birthday to my beautiful wifey. To Lil Problem from Jared. Thanks for the love and support. Here's to the new house. To Levi the Werewolf from the Bratty Princess. Lexi, happy birthday and I love you. And lastly, with a heavy heart, we have to Holly Hansold from Mark, Shauna, your Mama Joe, and your sons Caleb and Cameron, rest in peace. Our time together was short, but nothing short of amazing. Mm. We love you and we miss you deeply, but we know it's not goodbye, only see you later. Uh, like she that. was a huge fan and recently passed away from cancer. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so sending our love to you guys. I like the see you later part. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is our show. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith and Tyler C for the work on social media with Ryan Handelsman and his crew. Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to uh, Logan for directing and producing today. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for the upcoming book number four. Oh my God, we're just, I just finished writing all the episodes. Uh, thank you to producer Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week and Sarah Finch for the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you would like to watch this show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and to see pictures that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private Facebook group where you can meet fellow creeps and peepers. You can follow us on TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast. Going to be shaking the content, content up over there to make it more appealing. You're going to love it. And if you don't want any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad free and more. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Anyone else awake? Tell me a secret. I like to whisper in the dark.